that we would walk this out throughout the year, that there be many blessings and strength. As we strengthen ourselves in you and you alone, we believe that this word will come to pass in our lives. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. So, we're not talking about a normal army, okay? It was David and the mighty men. So David killed Goliath. So we got a giant slayer. And if you ever read on the mighty men, I could preach a sermon on that, but it might be, make, make you sick to your stomach, but the men would get it. These dudes were known for slaughtering people. And I'm not talking about one person. So they were the most feared army in the known world. It was David and his mighty men. So when they left, they were doing mercenary work. Right? They were being hired out to take care of some stuff so they could make money and things and bring it back. So when they came back, someone had attacked their home, which is shocking to them because they thought they were the last army that anybody ever would want to take on. Yet they come back and they had lost everything. Sometimes when we feel like we're at our greatest strength or the pinnacle of our lives, and then we feel like we've lost everything. Have you ever noticed that when you lose something, Sometimes it feels like you've lost everything. You notice that? Or people go like this, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm probably going to be homeless. And it's like the reality is 95% of people, that's not even ever going to be an option. But isn't that the feeling? Some people, 5%, that's a real thing. But for other people, it's like, I'm going to be, okay, you're not going to be homeless, though you might lose your home. Amen? But it feels like when you lose some things, it feels like you lost everything and that's what the enemy does or the spirit of amalekite amalekite is a very specific spirit that attacks you where you're vulnerable when you're tired to discourage you from believing and receiving the word of god so they thought surely none of this would happen to me have you ever thought that that would never happen to me and then it happens to you right i had someone that was speaking with me and sharing with me and they said I always secretly looked down on everyone that was divorced. And then I was left by my spouse. And I remember when I had to go fill out that piece of paper and it said married, single, or. And then I realized how judgmental I'd been all those years. Because it could never happen to me. So what they thought could never happen to them, happened to them. They felt like they lost it all because they did lose it all. And they were going to turn and literally kill David, the one who rescued them from all kinds of obscure things. So, interesting enough, David was only three days away from being crowned king of Judah. Everybody say three days. days. We got some encounters coming up in March. And God secretly wants to get you alone for three days. That's a whole nother sermon. Because God can do crazy things. Remember when Moses left Egypt? He said, we just want to go worship God for three days. But Pharaoh knew if they go for three days, they ain't coming back. How many know if you go for three days, you're not coming back the same? So God knows that. So does the enemy. That's why resistance takes place before breakthrough. When you choose to go to an encounter or you choose to do something or you choose to step out and do something out of faithfulness or the call of God, expect resistance sometimes discouragement is greatest when breakthrough is the closest sometimes discouragement is greatest when breakthrough is closest see the thief doesn't come to rob empty houses amen in john 10 10 says the thief comes to steal kill and destroy right but i've come Come on, Jesus said, but I've come. Four of you, that's great. Jesus said, but I've come. When Jesus comes, things change. He's come to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus said, but when I come, that you might have life and life more abundantly. See, everything's what the enemy's doing, the thief is stealing, until Jesus comes. And he says, not only will I give you what you've lost, abundantly or more abundantly means more than you can handle. Amen? Amen? You just got to be in a posture of handling it. You know what the posture of handling blessing looks like? You know, you want to see what the posture of not getting blessing looks like? Right? You release things to God, 
He can take things out of your hand and he can put it back in. If you hold on to it, you'll never have more than you have right now. So he said, I've come. See, it's not over. I love that song that we just sang. It's not over until God says it's over. Amen? And it's not over until God says it's good. So if it's not good, it's not over. Amen? Because our God is good. See, you have trials, and then you have fiery trials. How many know what I'm talking about? You have like, yeah, it's kind of been a rough week. Then you have the fiery trials. It's like, what the? Holy Ghost. I didn't think this could even happen to me. But yet, here I am. And it says, as though something strange was happening to you, but rejoice in as much as you participate in the suffering of Christ, so you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. There is no testimony without a test and a trial. Amen? We love the testimonies. But man, we don't love the trials, right? It's great to tell your story after the story. It's tough to tell it during the story, right? And sometimes, you know, they say equal positive reaction. Every action has an equal equal reaction. So you talk about like throwing a stone into a lake, and if it's a small stone, you get small ripples. And if it's a big stone, you get big waves. Sometimes the enemy empowers things where a pebble will make a wave. It's demonically charged to attack your life where it's most vulnerable to make you feel like you could or you have lost everything. So this is the year to recover all. This is a year to recover your identity. This is a year to recover your passion. This is a year to recover your joy. This is a year to recover your health. This is a joy to recover your finances. This is, a joy, this is the year that you'll recover not some but all. I speak that. But the enemy is over. You can clap for that. That's all right. It's the word of God. Those of you who don't want to are not allowed to. Don't let us catch you clapping. The enemy overpower or empowers certain things to come against your life, and he's always looking for a vulnerable point or a place of weakness. He turns up the heat. And it says, this, don't act like something strange is going on. Listen, just because something strange is happening to you doesn't mean you're strange. Five of you should say thank you, Pastor, because you have been wondering. <laughs> the rest of you? But you are not the sum of your circumstances. Listen, people may try to put you in a category, a box of where you are in your life or what's going on in your life, but the Lord doesn't see you like that. I don't care who sees you like that. You need to see yourself differently, right? You need to recover your identity. You need to know who you are. Don't let your friends tell you who you are. Don't let them tell you what you can do. Everybody plays safe Christian. I don't want to bother anybody. I'm just super nice. Jesus wasn't that nice. The problem is the church is nicer than Jesus. It's called people pleasing. Amen? And we're not men and women of the people. We're men and women of the Lord, but we love people, right? We don't pass judgment. You don't need to be rude. You don't need to do all these things. But what you do need to do is have some conviction in your life that's not determined by your parents, that's not determined by your connect group, that's not determined by your children or your friends. You have to have a conviction within you that determines that you're sold out for the Lord. Amen? And he says, hey, how will I know you're my disciples? How you show your love for one another. See, full acceptance is not full love. With love, there's correction. Amen? So you don't have to hate somebody to tell them you don't agree with them. And if they want to argue, you just stop talking to them. Right? But you don't sit back and close your mouth and just take what the world has to offer. You go, no, I don't agree with that. And let them say whatever they want. And know who you are and love them anyways. Amen? If you can't talk to somebody that disagrees about you on a subject and not lose your mind, we'll have an altar call at the end of service, and you can come back to human again and be Christian. No, he's like, we're so bent. I mean, people just want to, it's like, over what? Everything. No, everything. I hate Starbucks. Why like, whatever. I like to stand in long lines at Dutch Bros. Whatever, man. Do your thing. First Peter 5, 8, 9. 
It says, be alert and of sober mind. Now, we're not just talking about sobriety. We're talking about being alert, aware, to respond. Understand that the enemy, the enemy is coming after you. It says this, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same type of suffering. So what does mean? The enemy is like prowling like a lion. You never see a lion attack the front of the pack. They, just like the Amalekites in that spirit, it's looking for a place of vulnerability or weakness. So in those days, real men would fight, would line up, and they would fight battles. But the spirit of Amalekite went around and flanked them from the back and attacked their handicap, their weak, their children, and their women. Why all the men were gone. That's the spirit of Amalekite. It's a spirit that's looking for vulnerability, always looking for a place to push the boundaries, always trying to get into your life in some way that you hadn't seen or foreseen before it happened. It's vulnerable. It's weak. And so I remember when I was at a, out of Africa, this little wildlife preserve, whatever you want to call it over there, and I was there, and there, was, there were the lions are walking around. There's these guys that are walking around kicking kicking buckets and cans and stuff, and the lions are playing with them. But one dude was in the water. If you've seen it, there's, there was a water, huge thing of water, and he's in the middle of the water, and he would come out and engage with them, but then he'd back in. So I asked one of the people there, I said, oh, is that guy new? Because that's where I'd be, right? It's like you get a little courage, and you just move back into the water, you know what I mean? I might have a shocker and some other stuff that wouldn't be right for animals, but self-preservation seems to come high on my list when I'm encountering things that can kill me. But they said, no, actually, that's the veteran trainer. And I said, why is he in the water? He said, he made a mistake. He was working with one of the lions, and he fell down. Even the lions had worked with him since they were cubs. Lions are instinctively take advantage where advantage can be taken. The moment he fell down, the instinct of the lion, he pounced on him, right? Because he saw vulnerability. The moment he was vulnerable, he attacked him, even though he had known him forever. That's the enemy. He's looking for your vulnerabilities, in your attitude, in your speech, in your declarations, in your insecurities, in your fears. He's looking for vulnerability, and he will not stop attacking. You can blame who you want, but the enemy is on that thing like white on rice. You can get mad at everybody else, but the truth is, he's going to attack you where you personally are vulnerable. Because that's what they do. And that's what the Amalekites did. So listen, it's in Deuteronomy, this is where God's cursing the Amalekites. wonder what that sounded like. Yeah, probably like tongues, right? Okay. <laughs> Remember what the Amalekites did to you along the way when you came out of Egypt. When you were weary, listen, this is when the spirit of Mal Amalekite attacks. When you were weary and worn out, they met you on your journey and attacked all who were lagging behind. Do you see the lion? All those were weak flanked you from the back all those that were lagging behind they had no fear of god when the lord your god gives you rest from the enemies around you in the land i'm giving you to possess your inheritance you shall blot out the name of amalek from under heaven do not forget so god had a problem with anyone that attacked the israelites and just so you know he still does today he's the same yesterday today and forever i don't care what the college is teaching their students so when he came what happened was God says, I remember, see, God was specifically enraged with Amalekite because the way they attacked. He said, no, 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 they took out the weak. They took out the lagging. They hit you where you're vulnerable. They hit the women and the children. He says, oh, no, we're not going to attack them and win. We're going to blot out their name. That is our God. Attacked because they were attacked when they were most weak. No one like this was this dirty or diabolical or evil anywhere in all of the battles that we see so god was saying never forget what they've done because it was a demonic assignment against god's people the truth is this the devil is a liar oh no no whatever he's telling you well listen i'm going to free you from something right now whatever dumb stuff you've been thinking for the last week stop in jesus name you're welcome oh you all been thinking some you're like right whatever you've been thinking and you plant that little womb of your mind and it's starting to grow, you need to eradicate it now. You need to take the spirit of Amalek 
Amalek out of your mind and your heart and you start focusing on the things that God has instead of just getting discouraged like David's people. There's a time to mourn and then there's a time not to. Amen? Grieving is normal until it's not. Some things have happened to you last year. Grieving them is normal until it's not. Amen? You grieve, and they, we call it, when I was in hospice, we called it grieving appropriately. There's a time frame on appropriate grieving, and then you just become a victim. God has not called us to a victim mentality, but he's called us to grieve. It says that they wept until they could weep no more. But then there was a time to get up and go to war. Amen? The truth is this, God has something amazing planned for you this year. He just needs your agreement and participation. (laughs) He can't do it for you. He can't do it on his own. He needs your agreement and participation, and he'll do all that he's promised in your life. Another example of the Amalekites, it says the Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites, Rephidim, Moses and Joshua, choose some of our men and go fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I'll stand on the hill with the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua fought. Amalekites have been fighting against God's people forever. So Moses had ordered Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands, they were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. Whenever we're disunified or against each other, we will lose. Amen. So they went, they put a rock down, they had Moses sit down, and then they took his hands and lifted his hands up, and they held his hands. This is a picture of unity and strength within the body of Christ. And they held up his hands till they were completely defeated. It says, so Joshua overcame the Malachite army with the sword. And the Lord said to Moses, write this on a scroll as something to remember and make sure that Joshua hears it, because I'll completely blot out the name again of Amalek under the heaven." Moses built an altar, called it, The Lord is my banner. He said, Because my hands were lifted up against the throne of the Lord, the Lord will, the Lord will be at a war against Malachites from generation to generation. Don't subdue something that's supposed to be eradicated in your life. That's what Saul did. I don't have time to go into it. But King Saul came, and the Lord said, Completely blot out their name. Instead, he blotted most of them out. Then he kept some herds, kept some people, kept the king, kept all this stuff. So he kept, he kept a remnant. You know, it's like a start of any Western movie, right? You don't leave the son alive. It's going to be two hours of him getting even. <laughs> no, right? They're like, we'll just leave that boy there. Bad idea. You know what I mean? Bad idea. I've seen it enough. And the, after about three of them, I thought, you better take him out. I know it's not right, but you better know. But see, there's things in your life you need to completely take out and stop leaving a piece. Because that piece... Or that pet sin will grow up and attack you. You can go play with a lion cub. But when it grows up, it potentially will kill you. I always remember reading in the news, Bengal tiger kills owner in backyard. And I'm going, okay, let me start here. Why do you have a Bengal tiger, in any tiger, in your backyard? Right? No, you read it and you think about it. You're like, wait, 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 wait. This is not a pet. Amen? I know you think you're cool. Good. Take pictures from the window. Get that pool that that trainer had, right? But I want to tell you, there was a time that a guy told me, he goes, well, I'm moving. He goes, will you take my Cayman? And I said, what's a Cayman? And he showed me, it's a little alligator. You know, little ones with all the little eyes stick up in the lake. And I'm like, that's an alligator. He goes, no, no, it's a Cayman. I said, okay, that's a small alligator. I said, (laughs) That small alligator, though it's not going to get as big as a huge alligator, it's still going to get bigger, and that thing can bite me or one of my children. I said, I'll tell you what, I'll do, I'll do you a favor. I'll go take it and throw it in the trash right now. <laughs> See, we let these small things in our life that are cute, because everything small is cute. I don't know when women made that up. <laughs> Except for men. You guys are mean to small men. <laughs> not so cute anymore, is it? I want you all to repent of... Being mean to small men and heavy women. They're not treated well in this society, and I reject it in Jesus' name. My wife told me, if I wear heels, I'm taller than you. I said, all right. How high can you wear them? (laughs) 
But Diane can pull that with tennis shoes. But I'm going to leave that right there. I got to get back to my notes. <laughs> ben goes, yeah, get back to what you were saying. <laughs> Number two, being spiritual doesn't mean you don't have to feel emotions. Spiritual people are not emotionless people. It's okay to feel emotions. It's not okay to let emotions dictate your life. Or when you start trying to control other people because how you feel, that's called demonic. Amen? Because when you feel something, it must be regulated by your spirit. You ever see kids in a grocery store arguing with mom over candy or whatever, you know, because they put it right by, the, right by the register to torment you? And the kids are like, give me, give me. You see mom, what you, just trying to give them stuff to quiet them down? And, you know, five people are in there thinking, that kid probably need to be whooped. But they don't say that, because, you know, you're not allowed to. But he's like, I'm good at it. You know, I have some skills I could train. Well, the problem is not the child and the problem is not the parent. The problem is the child's parenting the parent instead of the parent parenting the child. See, emotions are fine, but they should not parent your spirit and soul. Your spirit should parent your emotions. When you get emotional and blame somebody else, what you're saying is I'm completely out of control and it's somebody else's fault. That's a victim mentality. You are responsible for your emotions. Listen, I know this is hard for all of us. No matter what anyone else does, you're still responsible for your emotions. That's why they're called yours. Your emotions are not somebody else's. Stop emotionally sharing. People that get emotional about the same things, get angry about Don't talk to those people. Talk about something else. Right? You get people that go through, what do they call that, babe? Um, trauma bonding right? I hate women. I hate men. Then you get a group of people. We all hate women. We all hate men. You know what I mean? They trauma bond. It's so, so unhealthy. It may be, you might feel good for a minute. Spiritual people don't allow negative emotions to rule over their lives. Spiritual people do not allow negative emotions to rule over them or their lives. It's okay to be emotional. David wept, right? But then it says this, I love this. Then he strengthened himself in the Lord. No one was there to strengthen him. Listen, I love encouraging people. I love being encouraged. But there's times in your life that no one's going to encourage you and you're responsible for your own emotions to go get strengthened and encouraged in the presence of God. Right? We love the gift of encouragement. We love to encourage. But there's some times that the only place you can go to get it is in the presence of God. You can look for it everywhere else. You can blame people for not even encouraging, not saying the right things, not doing the right things. And God's like, come to me and be strengthened and encouraged. It's like when you're driving and you have all these amazing drivers around here. I'll just leave that very simple. Getting mad at them is not sin. Acting or gesturing after that is sin. Feel emotions, do the right thing. <laughs> I have a name for him, it's happy. Way to go, happy, just make your way over. That's why I call everybody happy. I don't, I don't say it happy, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> and I've lost it a couple times. And then, but that's, feeling that's one thing, but acting on it is different. It's okay to feel things. Some things that you feel shouldn't be voiced to other people. Listen, especially if they already feel that way, you're, em you're empowering their demonic activity by your voice. You can create fear amongst those that have fear, right? You can create anxiety amongst those that have anxiety by sharing your anxiety. You should, you should share your anxiety with someone who doesn't. If you're dealing with a spirit or something going on in your emotions, please don't share it with someone with the same emotions. Go to somebody different. Amen? Amen? It's like, man, I got a problem drinking. Me too. Let's get together. <laughs> Who's buying? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> Grief is normal when you lose something or someone. And I know there's been a lot of loss this year. We've lost people. We've lost things. People have lost jobs. We've lost finances. We've lost relationships. 
But it's normal. David and them cried. But you can't bottle it up. Grief is normal. If you bottle it, it'll come out later in a super unhealthy way. Right? But grief is good until it's not. If you ever look at the things in your fridge, there's something called an expiration date. How many look at those all the time? How many of you look at those when the milk's a little thick? You don't look at it, then you go, oh, I think, then you check it, right? Something's wrong, or you smell it, right? <laughs> Everything has an expiration date, and we know there's a little, how many of you love to play like the, it's only two weeks? <laughs> you kind of like, I know they have to put in their extra, so I know I got a couple weeks on this. It smells good, let's do it, right? I don't know why the kids are sick. <laughs> but everything in there has an expiration date. Guess what? So should your grief. It has an expiration date to where it goes from healthy to not healthy anymore. Amen? Spiritual means I do spiritual things that are contrary to the way I feel right now. I don't want to do this, but it's right, so I'm going to do it. That's spiritual. Amen? So it's like kind of, don't do the things in Christianity that you love. Make sure you're doing the things that you don't love. Amen? Right? Well, I'm generous. I love to give. Okay, try fasting. Well, I love fasting. Try giving more. See, don't just do the thing you love. Make sure you're doing the things that are going to challenge you to be who you're called to be, not just the things that you like. Or you might feel that your Christianity is literally being led by your emotions. It's like emotion. It's like when we worship, right? Sometimes you don't feel like worshiping. You come in. That's got to be rough on the worship team, right? I don't feel like worshiping. <laughs> but you make yourself enter in. You're like, I don't feel like it today. But then you put your hands up. And then maybe the second or third song starts pulling you in. And then you realize that your spirit just dictated and your emotions followed instead of the other way around. Some people are like, I just love to worship. But some people don't. You come in and you need to worship. Young people, you need to worship and come in and stay there until your emotions say this is right. Right? I would say old people, but I'm afraid to point anywhere. <laughs> I can say, if I say old people point, it's like, well, they just left the church. <laughs> Who are you calling old? But every believer has the opportunity, listen, every believer, say that's me, has the opportunity and responsibility to encourage themselves in the Lord. It is an opportunity, but also it's your, say mine, mine. Responsibility. responsibility. It's not your spouses, it's not your kids, not your parents. You have a responsibility and opportunity as a believer to strengthen yourself in the Lord, right? I can't encourage my kids unless I'm encouraged, right? When you get on play, what do they say? Yeah, if we lose oxygen, make sure you put your mask on yourself first before. Do that with encouragement. Strengthen yourself before you strengthen other people. Or you might find you're weakening them. Amen? You have to encourage yourself first, and then we can pass it on and encourage others. Right? David had been through this before. David had experienced some things none of us experienced. I'm going to tell you what. Time does not heal all wounds. But Jesus does. But Jesus does. Amen? David recovered. He wept and recovered in the same day. How I many you know that's good? When I, when I hit the brick wall and my whole life fell apart, it was about 10 years ago, 11 years ago, it took me nine months. David did it in a day. I'm like, man, I could have really sped things up. <laughs> How I many of you know what I'm talking about? And one day he wept, and then he went and attacked and recovered all. I took like nine months. And if it wasn't for God's grace and mercy on that journey, I would have never even much less made it back, but even the blessings that God's poured over my life in spite of me, not because of me. When your pastor's got a limp, I don't know what to tell you. But David encouraged himself in the Lord. Listen to this. This is, this is really important. You'll be a lifetime victim of the circumstances of your life if you think other people are in control of your emotions. Stop blaming anyone else for your emotions. If they're great, it's you and the Lord. If they're terrible, it's just you. You like that? <laughs> right? It's kind of like the IRS, right? My company makes money, they want a piece. We lose money, they're not there. No, it's, it's, so, everything good in you is God in you, so here's the deal. 
You can't blame your emotions on other people. They're yours, and they're going to affect your life and your well-being and your peace. Amen? This says in 3 John, Beloved, you'll prosper as your soul prosper. Your mind, will, and emotions. That's your job to care for those things so you can care for others. If your soul's out of whack, your life's going to be out of whack. Amen? Men, don't tell your wife you make me feel that way. I'm going to give you a little piece of wisdom. Number one, it won't work out well physically, but spiritually it's a lie. <laughs> right? See what you're doing to me? Oh, no, this, this is a good word. Apparently it's a good word. Everybody's like, <laughs> take responsibility for your emotions, for your peace, for your joy. They are yours, and you can go to the Lord and get them from him when nobody else is providing it. Anybody in here are the people that seem to do really well and dig into God when things are really bad? <laughs> I tend, when it hits the fan, to be the most calm. I got it covered. And then normal stuff, I'm just like losing my mind. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know how this works. You know, because when it hits the fan, you're like, I got to step up, man. We're in a battle. But it's the small battles when I'm tired and weary and vulnerable and small things that start attacking me and I thought I never thought that could happen to me do whatever it takes don't settle feed on the word eat the word pray Start feeding on things. Stop, stop feeding on social media and feed on the word of God. Stop feeding on social media and start feeding from books. Start feeding, start feeding yourself. Start declaring the things of God instead of regurging the talk of men. And you'll find that your spirit gets strong even in the most difficult times. Even when you've been hit, even when you feel like you're gonna lose it all or you've lost it all, if you strengthen yourself in the Lord, he'll prepare you to recover all. Listen, that's an if. If you strengthen yourself in the Lord, you'll be prepared to recover all. Amen? Listen to this. Every decision you make while you're discouraged is a bad one. Well, I should, no. Strengthen yourself in the Lord, break off your discouragement, then ask him what to do. That's what David did, right? He wept, and then he said, Lord, should I pursue him? Me, I'd have, been, I'd have already been on the way, crying on the way with a sword, right? You take that from me. <laughs> Probably would have made it halfway. I'd take a nap. <laughs> but he, no, he, he wept, strengthened himself in the Lord, said, what should I do? And then followed it out, and he recovered all. That words are not just for him, but it's for us. Isaiah 40, 31, one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible. So he that waits on the Lord, his strength shall be renewed. He shall mount up on wings of eagles. He should walk and not grow weary. He will run and not grow faint or strike that reverse it. run and not grow weary walk not grow faint if you wait on the Lord there's the word in the Hebrew or in some other translations are those that will hope in the Lord because waiting on the Lord not passively but actively is hoping in the Lord and that word means to twist or to bind. When you, when you twist yourself up with the Spirit of God and the things of God and you wait on the Lord, your strength, this is a promise of God, will, not can, will be renewed. And in that, you can recover all. Last point as we close. God can speak to you about your future when you're encouraged enough to believe it. God can speak to you today about your future when you're encouraged enough to believe it and receive it. You gotta be good soil for his seed. If you're like, man, I don't got no reason to be encouraged, but I'm encouraged. Strengthen yourself in the Lord, receive that seed and see if it does start to bear fruit in your life because that's a promise in the word of God. It said David was greatly distressed because they were gonna stone him, but he strengthened himself in the Lord. Listen, if it's God's will, it'll succeed. Amen? If it's God's will, it'll come to pass. For those of you who didn't know what point number one is, it's the enemy wouldn't attack you if you weren't a threat. Because I know some of you in here are like, I didn't. Gotcha. You can't reap and walk out the call of God until you recovered the things that you've lost spiritually. 
A lot of those things may be physical, but I'm talking about spiritually. Reclaim your passion this year. Have you felt like your passion's kind of tapered off? Or your hope? Or your joy or your identity? I don't even know if I belong here. I don't even know what a discouragement starts to kind of creep in. You start to wonder weird things, and your mind's getting all, and God goes, look, I have a word from you. If you're encouraged enough and ready to receive it, not only will I give it to you, you can walk it out. So that's the first part of this year. Come on, let's be standing. First part of this year, recover all. What has the enemy taken from you? The spirit of Amalekite, that devil, that, that devil, that demonic spirit that has hit you in your vulnerability. Maybe in your family. Maybe in your faith. Maybe in your finances. Maybe you've lost, like I did at one point in my life, the very will to live. I'm going to tell you he'll meet you there. And if you encourage yourself in him, he'll take you to places, not just back to where you were, but places you've never been. That's his promise because that's who our God is. He's not done with you. Listen, if it's not good, it's not over. Come on, if it's not good, it's not over. God's not done with you. This is a year, listen, to recover all. I want you to go home today, you and your family, if you can, get together and write the things that you're believing you're going to recover this year. Maybe you need to recover your innocence. Maybe you need to recover your Christianity or your faith. Maybe you need to recover your purity. Maybe you need to recover your passion or your conviction or your purpose or your, or your encouragement or operating in your gifts or your finances, whatever it is. Whatever it is, I want you to write it down and I want you to be encouraged enough just to believe it and start to say, God, this is the year you help me recover. I believe you, I'm encouraged, and I receive it. Because he's come that you might have life and life abundantly. Amen? Come on, let's give the Lord a hand. And after you overcome in the first part of this year, God's going to stamp you as he already calls you an overcomer. You're going to teach others in your family how to overcome. You're going to be a catalyst. You're going to be a model for generations in your family. They're going to go, yeah, well, we're like this. Yeah, well, you know what? Remember, remember Uncle Sean and what he did? You're going to be the one that they talk about, that they can get encouraged because you set the stage through generations. Don't wait until December to say, well, 2024 was. We will declare it and prophesy it right now. Amen? Lord, I just thank you for everyone here. Come on, just lift your hands in this place. Come on, receive the word for you today. Recover all. Not some, not part. Recover all. This is the year you recover all. I speak it over you right now in the name of Jesus. Receive it for you, for your finances, for your family, for your faith. Just keep receiving it. Come on, this is the year, 2024. This is the year you recover all in Jesus' name. And everybody said, come on, give the Lord a hand. Amen, amen. Come on, how many ready to get some stuff back? All right, all right. If you're in here and you've never given your life to Jesus, we're glad you're here. It's the beginning of the year. First thing you need to recover is your soul. Amen. You need to be activated in your spirit. And that comes by recognizing what God has done for you. That you were created on purpose for a purpose. The Bible says we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory. That means we've all messed it up. Don't worry. If you're like, I messed it up, welcome to the team. Every single one of us have messed it up. But God sent his son Jesus to walk on the earth and he took the stripes on his back to heal you, to give you hope, and to give you a future, not just on earth, but also in heaven. They took Jesus, they crucified him, he died. Three days later, he rose from the dead. And the Bible says, believe it in your heart, confess it with your mouth and you'll be saved. That means you go to heaven, but it also means Jesus will come and walk with you and be with you for the rest of your life. So if that's you need to give your life to Jesus this morning on the count of three, I want you to raise your hand. One, two, three, where are you at? Come on, let's start the new year right. Come on. Come on. Come on, amen, amen. Anybody else? 
Come on, we'll throw out all the cliches. New year, new you, you do you. Whatever it takes. Anybody else? Come on. You do Jesus. Raise your hand. Anybody here need to get saved? Come on, don't leave the same. Amen. Come on, brother. Oh, God's already all over you, bro. I can see it from here. He's got a plan and a purpose. The enemy's been lying to you. And that is, your, your track record has been wiped clean. He's not giving you a second chance, but a new beginning. Speak that over you right now in Jesus' name. Anybody else? Come on, anybody else? You need to give your life to Jesus. Come on, don't be afraid to lift your hand. Be afraid not to. You like that? You don't like that? Anybody else? We have time. Anybody here need to rededicate? God's been drawing you back. You've been far away, but it's time. It's time to come to the throne. Receive your inheritance. Anybody need to rededicate? Amen. Amen. All right, anybody else? Anybody else? Amen, amen. Come on, brother. Praise God. Come on, church. You can do better than that. Praise God. Anybody else you said, I want to be the last one? Amen, amen. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Come on, you guys didn't think crazy stuff like that? If the pastor stands on one leg and says it one more time, you didn't think like that? I did for us saved. I'm like, if he leans on his own. It's crazy to be human, but it's good to be saved. Amen? Anybody else? Come on, we're closing. Anybody else? Yeah. Amen. Amen, brother. Come on. Praise God. They have been praying for you and waiting for this day. But you know what? So is the Lord. He is so excited about your future, what he's doing in your life. I'm proud of you. Great job, man. Great job. All right, we have time. Dolphins don't play the late game. Anybody else? Anybody else? You can have fun in church loud or I won't come. What we're going to do now is if you raise your hand to give your life to the Lord to rededicate, we're going to ask you to come to the front. Now relax. We're not going to embarrass you. You don't have to talk in the microphone or anything like that. We just want to pray for you, and you don't have to come alone. So if, if you have a friend or someone that came with you, have them come up with you, but just have them stand behind you so we know who they're praying for. If you don't have a friend, pick one on the way up. They, <laughs> Amen. Come on, let's give them a hand as they come forward. There it is. God, I want you to remember this moment. God is so proud of you guys. He loves you guys so much. So we're just going to pray with you. Come on, church, let's pray with them. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for my sins. Separate them as far as the east is from the west. Come into my heart. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. And by your grace, Help me to live for you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Okay, we have, uh, we have Miss Tammy right over here. We're going to ask you guys just to walk over there. She's just going to get some information and pray for you guys real quick. Take about five minutes. Come on, let's just give them a hand as they go. Come on, church. That's a good start. Come on. 